Good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're tuning in from today. Um, thanks for joining us for this NCAR Explorer series conversation called Hurricanes, Clouds, and Wildfires, A Changing Climate and the Impact on Our Kids. Um, today we have our panelist, Dr. Melissa Burt from Colorado State University, Dr. Emily Fisher um, from Colorado State University, and NCAR scientist, Dr. Rosemarios Berrios. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. And my name is Dr. Lorena Medina Luna, and I am an education designer and lead organizer for the Explorer Series at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, um, which is a world leading organization dedicated to the study of the atmosphere, the Earth system, and the sun. And today we're all coming virtually from our homes. So we're happy that you can join us and letting us into your own homes or wherever you might be tuning in from. Throughout the event, you'll be, able, you'll be able to ask questions and engage with interactive polls. So I see some of you have already started doing that through our Slido platform. So if you scroll down this page, you can join Slido and answer um, also some of our word clouds that we have and the polls. Um, the, the word cloud currently is, how are you feeling about climate change? And we'll come back to this cloud, word cloud later in the conversation today. This will be recorded and available through our NCAR Explorer series website. So if you'd like to share it with your family and friends or colleagues, definitely welcome to do so in a few um, days. And let's go ahead and meet our panelists. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us um, this morning here in Colorado. Or, and um, Dr. Melissa Burt, let's go ahead and start with you. You're a um, scientist at Colorado State University, and you work on understanding um, the Arctic. Can you tell us a little bit more specifically what, what it is that you've studied? Yeah, thanks, Lorena. Thank you for having me, and I'm happy to be a part of today's conversation. So in my research, I look at uh, the role of clouds, essentially, in Arctic climate change. In particular, kind of looking at the interactions that occur between the clouds and the sea ice um, during the fall and winter times, because this is one of the strongest periods where we're seeing amplified warming in this region. Um, I also look at, you know, the influence of clouds on the Arctic system, how Arctic climate change influences and impacts our larger global climate. And, you know, um, one thing that I guess I'll say here is that, you know, climate change is something that is really visible in the Arctic. It has been warming for decades, um, significantly more than the rest of the earth. And these, these polar regions, I would say, are kind of the early indicators to what climate change is really going to look like for us here on the earth. Um, and, and what I've learned a lot, and I know this is going deeper than what you asked, but what I really learned in talking with people, you know, who live in these communities is that they've had to really think through, you know, what does their environment look like? How has it changed over the generations? Um, thinking about the places that they love, the things that they like to do, um, even just their, their way of life has really been altered from climate change so far over the last few decades. And that impacts you know, the ways that they, they hunt and they gather their food. It impacts the ways in which they transport either through boat or you know, on sleds on the ice. I mean, if, even having them think about, you know, how do they build their homes? And so, you know, one of the things that I think is important to talk about here is that climate change, yes, we saw it starting to happen in the Arctic, but is no longer an, an Arctic issue um, at all. So it's something that we need to think about, you know, locally, regionally, in, in the places that we actually live in um, here. Great, thank you. And if we go locally, you know, Colorado had a lot of wildfires. Last year, there was a lot. Um, and I could see the smoke like outside of my house. It was far away, but it was it was close to a lot of homes. Um, and Dr. Emily Fisher, you work on understanding the impact of wildfires um, at Colorado State University. And I've seen you in action with the C-130, the NSF NCAR C-130 plane um, going out to, to study wildfires. Can you tell us a little bit more um, closer to home? How have the changes in our climate impacted wildfires? And what do you what do you specifically work on in wildfires, understanding wildfires? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Emily, and I'm a faculty member uh, up here at CSU, for those of you who are in Boulder. Um, so my research group studies a lot of different aspects of wildfires, um, all the way from how um, 
our house climate, um, changing the conditions that support wildfires and what will we expect moving forward uh, through um, what's the composition of wildfire smoke? How does that change with time? What are you breathing when you're within hours of a wildfire versus two days downwind? Those kinds of questions. Where does wildfire smoke travel when areas are burning? So what are the predominant transport pathways of smoke? What regions are susceptible to other regions uh, um, with extreme wildfires? And then my team, um, finds a lot of uh, interest and joy in collaborating with uh, uh, epidemiologists and economists to try to understand who's exposed when, that's the atmospheric science piece, and then passing that information along to help us understand what the health impacts are of smoke and what are sort of the full suite of impacts when a community is um, impacted by smoke. So I like to study things that I can see. And so my research group works on a, a lot of different air pollutants, but it's really hard to ignore wildfires uh, now. And so, um, so those of you who were in Colorado last summer, right? It was, we had an extreme wildfire burn year, year um, by, by any measure. The fires grew very rapidly, right? And they, you know, at least the one up here by our house um, grew almost till it was fuel limited, right? The Cameron Peak fire and became the largest fire in Colorado history. So um, between summer 2018, flying around in the C-130 <laughs> into wildfire smoke, and then summer 2020, where um, my family was, was um, uh, directly impacted by the, the smoke, um, I was really rattled sort of by these large wildfire seasons. But at the same time, these uh, large wildfire seasons are really no surprise. So, um, you know, the conditions, for example, in Colorado last year, the, you know, very extreme drought, warm temperatures, right, that, that aridity um, has, has been over the last 30, 40 years associated with extreme um, or, or burn area on the high end. And so it really was no surprise um, what happened last year here in Colorado. When you look at the historical context, we just had to have an ignition source or a few of them. <laughs> so that's that's what my research um, has focused on lately with respect to fires and, and moving forward. I'm really interested in, in working with teams on uh, communication around wildfire smoke. How do we protect ourselves? How do we protect our communities? Because there certainly will be more fires moving forward. Great. Thank you so much. And Dr. Rosimar, um, you're a scientist at NCAR. Um, but you're also from Puerto Rico who have been impacted by hurricanes. And, you know, hurricanes are pretty devastating. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more about what it is that you study specifically on hurricanes? Sure. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, my name is Rosemar Rios Berrios. I am a research meteorologist in the mesoscale microscale division of NCAR. And like Lorena said, I grew up in Puerto Rico. I lived there until 2012. So most of my life so far was spent there in Puerto Rico. And every summer we were always on the lookout waiting to see, is there going to be a hurricane coming through? How, and if, the, if it doesn't come through, will it get close? Close enough to give us impacts or not close enough that we can still have a sunny day and go and enjoy a regular day, right? Puerto Rico being a small island means that just a teeny tiny change in the path of a hurricane can mean anything from very devastating winds and rain to just a sunny day with a hurricane just very nearby. So yeah, growing up and just experiencing that made me very curious about why we couldn't just say for certain, like, yes, the hurricane will come in five days. Um, just get ready. And I thought, well, let me just do it better. I'm going to go there and stand in front of your TV and give you the perfect forecast. <laughs> and lo and behold, I quickly realized that it's a lot more complicated than just standing in front of a TV and giving you a forecast. I have a lot of respect for those people who do it. But behind the scenes, what goes on is that our atmosphere is so complex that predicting it can be very difficult. And when it comes to hurricanes, it, there is just so many factors at, at play and that's what motivated me to go into a research career where I am 
just behind the scenes trying to do the research that will lead to a better prediction of hurricanes and heavy rainfall now and in the future. And so um, now I live in Colorado and I Colorado, Colorado doesn't experience hurricanes, right? But all of my family is still in Puerto Rico. So in, in 2018 was a pretty devastating year around the world with many hurricanes. But for my family in particular, Hurricane Maria left them without power, without communication. I could not get in touch with them like for a month. I believe it was in the end, they did not have power for exactly a hundred days. And right after Hurricane Maria, a study came out telling us that maybe in the future we will see more of those hurricanes like Maria. We don't know if we will see more hurricanes in total, but we may expect to see more of the very strong hurricanes. And that together with 2020, which was a record breaking hurricane season was really a wake up call to all of us who study hurricanes to start uh, learning more or not start because there is a lot of work going into it, but really learn more about how our hurricanes will be affected in the future by climate change. Yeah, so from the Arctic to the tropics, there's an impact on what all you study. Um, and you've been scientists for a while now. You've done research programs of students, going into PhD programs, postdoctoral, and now research scientists. And along the way, you've also become moms. And I'm curious, how has, um, has it changed the way that you've thought about the impacts of the research that you're working and how that's gonna impact the kids that you're raising in the war in the world today with these changes in the climate. Melissa, can you go first? Yeah, you know, and for me, you know, what Rosie and Emily talked about are very local things that we experience where we live right now, right? And although I study the Arctic, you know, in talking with people there, um, you know, I've seen that the climate has been changing, right, for a very long time. And I think for me as a mom, you know, you want your kids to have, you know, a better, you want everything in your kid's life to be better than what you had, right? You want them to be able to experience everything that you love and you enjoyed in your life so that they could really reap the, the full benefits of those activities. And for, I think in becoming a mom, it's made me, it's, it's like fueled me in a way to want to continue to work really hard on solving these problems. I think our kids look to us. Sometimes it's probably superheroes, right? Like moms can do everything. Um, <laughs> and we can do a lot of things, right? And we really will work hard to kind of solve these problems, but we alone can't be the only ones to solve the problem. And so I think for me, it's just really um, challenged me to, to want to continue to do the research that I'm doing, but also to use my voice in a way to have conversations with people so that they know that they have a responsibility or even a role to play in, in trying to, you know, move things forward as we, was, as we talk about like tackling climate change in that way. So I think she has just given me um, this fuel in a way that just kind of makes me not want to give up even when I'm tired, even when it's devastating to, to hear about and to watch and to see, but to really like give me the light and the hope to want to just continue to move forward. Thank you. And how about um, Rosimar or Emily? Um, Go ahead, Rosie. Okay. <laughs> so um, my son is only a year old. <laughs> So um, it's been quite the wild ride already, but he was born in 2020, a very interesting year by all means. But one of the things that happened was that, and that Emily mentioned was that we had record-breaking like wildfires in Colorado and the smoke was very bad. And I had a four month baby when one of the biggest, when the biggest fire was burning. And even though I wasn't, very close to here the wind was transporting all the smoke here and I love taking my baby outside and that's something that I am instilling in him the love for nature and I think he's getting it because he was very cranky this weekend because he couldn't get outside side note but um, the point being that 
it was just really scary the fact that it was so smoky and that the air quality was so bad and that his lungs were so delicate that I could not take him outside and that was just very scary to me and it made me think about like how is his future gonna be like like what is is he gonna be experiencing if we continue with the trend that we're going in terms of our global warming at the same time there were hurricanes um like unfortunately like making landfall in the united states making it um, close to Puerto Rico and I was just thinking about all the places where I would love to take him and that I may not be able to take him because they may be like affected by flooding or by very strong winds and so in a sense becoming a mom um, like Melissa said it it like in a way it made me think like I really want to keep fighting for him even when I'm tired and exhausted and frustrated. But at the same time, it really like brought the feeling of being scared for the future, like a lot more intensely than it already was. So um, I also, so I have two daughters. My, my kids are older, um, not that much older though, six and nine now. Um, so kindergarten and third grade. So we're at a different stage. Um, we so that last last summer uh, we were backpacking um, right right by where the Cameron Peak fire started, and so we were we were scary close and and had to run out. Um, and so that experience, you know, really really um, has stuck with my children. It's not surprising, but it you know it really has. They're they're nervous about going hiking this summer still. Um, and then you know all summer sort of. Um, having the smoke come over and change the light, right? And, you know, all the experience of, of uh, the, the wildfires this summer. You know, I would try to time my runs this summer to go under the smoke, right? So I'm, I'm looking at the air quality <laughs> and I'm thinking, all right, we're, we're in the yellow. I'm gonna go for a run right now for my, uh, my mental health here. And so, you know, you go running and, you know, you just come home and you look up, right? And I could see the plume every, pretty much every afternoon. Right, and there were many afternoons where I would just sit there and I just start crying on my front steps um, because that's the feeling of climate change, right? So, not that every fire can be blamed on climate change, and you know, but but this this feeling of more um, natural disasters, more risks for our kids. The timeline of change is the same timeline. Um, uh, on which the three of us are going to be in our intensive parenting stage from, from taking little kids up through high school graduation, right? That's the timeline for action. That's the timeline for um, expected very large changes in our, in our world. And so that's sort of the feeling of climate change. And um, so I would say, um, I don't know that my research portfolio is really changing because I have kids, right? I only have so many skills <laughs> to bring to the table <laughs> as a professor. But, but I'm certainly um, crystallizing in my mind, like to work on the most important things um, and to uh, communicate uh, what, what the data really means, right? Beyond, beyond just numbers and axes, what these timelines really are in terms of our lives. And I think Emily, you were saying that, that feeling like, you know, we all felt that feeling of this past summer. And I think, also the visuals, like we can look outside and see what it looks like. Sometimes it looks pretty, right, in a way, and you can have a conversation about what's actually happening. But also I think, you know, I know your story about what happened last summer and I was talking to my daughter who's five, right? And she said, what were they doing? They were hiking. And even, even Mia, who wasn't there on that event that you all were experiencing, she said, is that gonna happen when we go hiking, right? So our kids are asking those questions, right? And you can, you can see it on their face that they're concerned, even if they don't know how to say the words, of what's actually happening. But I think, again, that's what goes back to like wanting us to really think about what's important and fueling us in a way to have a conversation, even like what we're having today, because it can feel very sad, but I think we also have hope because of our kids, right? And because of the next generations that we can do something about it. 
Yeah. Right. There's nothing that ties you more to the future than having kids, right? You're hundred percent in when you have kids. <laughs> yeah. So that's also, you know, that is how I feel too. It's like, all right, let's fix this. Yeah. And Emily, I've actually seen that you've taken your kids to field campaigns. So they're aware that you're doing studies, that you're investigating scientific questions that have an impact. And it sucks that, you know, they saw firsthand the wildfire smoke that you typically fly over or around um, through the C-130. And uh, I have a question, um, one from John, and we won't show it exactly because I'm going to rephrase it a bit, but it's kind of talking about, you know, um, the soils that are drying, the loss of moisture and content. And you talked about, you know, having that environment that would likely be prone to more wildfires. And I guess I wonder, do you agree that there is more drying landscapes that are fueling wildfires? Um, the question is if you can share your thoughts about, about something like that. Sure. So um, when you look back on sort of year-to-year -year variability or interannual variability in burn area for different Western US ecosystems, the um, environmental drivers that uh, correlate with uh, larger burn areas vary depending on the location. So in some areas, um, winter precipitation, the prior winter precipitation is really important. In some areas, you know, it's spring and summer temperature that's really important. In the Rockies in particular, in the, the, the sort of the, our ecosystem that runs, you know, from Montana down um, south of us here, right, in, in our area, in the best predictor of the interannual variability in burn area is aridity. And so that's when I say um, for Colorado for last year, it was sort of right in step with what you would expect. So there's, we don't understand everything, how everything will change moving forward in a warmer world. But one thing we do know is that we are likely to have um, for the United States, a more thirsty atmosphere. <laughs> and so, so, um, if all the same um, relationships hold, so between year-to-year -year, um, uh, changes in burn area and environmental conditions, we expect to have drier years moving forward and we'd expect more extreme burn area in the Rockies based on that. And so that's where that's coming from. It's a, it's a paper by my student, Steve Bry, that was published in Earth's Future last year. But each ecosystem is different. Um, and you have to you have to look ecosystem by ecosystem, and right humans also start fires. Um, we also try to put them out. Um, there's also different land management choices that can be made, right? And so it's not the only driver of of changes in burnt area, but it's certainly one of them. Great, and thank you, John, for that question. And I know we're talking about a lot of the the feelings that come about with our changing climate, and we actually have a word cloud about it, and then followed by a question. Um, but Paul or Dan, would you be able to share with us the word cloud of um, how are you feeling about climate change? We have the biggest one. So as a word clouds, if there's many people that put in similar words, then we have um, the word get larger. And they see we're trying to troubleshoot, but essentially the biggest one is concerned. There's people that are anxious, they're scared, they're frustrated, they're worried. Um, change needs to happen. So we can do a lot better. And then I want action. Some people are heartbroken. And I've heard you all on the panel also say some of these words. And, you know, one of the questions that we have is, you know, it says um, from Layla, it says, I'm terrified about talking to my son about climate change because I'm afraid that I can't without scaring him. I'm an expert. Do you have any suggestions? And Melissa, you kind of started to talk about this already. And thank you, Paul and Dan, for sharing that word, Cloud. Um, but you, you guys started talking about, you know, talking with your five-year-old. It's like, am I going to get caught in a wildfire if I go hiking? You know, there's already these fears they're young, but they understand. So how do you all talk with your kids? Are you coming off mute, Emily? Okay, <laughs> I'll go first. I guess I'll say, you know, um, like I said, my daughter is five. I think, you know, I guess the first thing that I would say, I believe that was Layla who asked the question, is that we have to talk about it because it's important, right? It's an important issue that our kids need to be aware of. And for, for my daughter, who's five, you know, we, we go out 
kind of similar to what Rosie was saying, we go out, we explore the outdoors, we talk about, um, you know, the beauty, the creatures that are out there, like what are they experiencing, you know, how they do different things. And I don't go into the deep dive as to like the devastation about climate change right now, but I think just getting her to have a, um, a understanding of how we can be like better stewards of the earth is something that's really important in the conversations that I have. I'll say there are a number of different like books and resources that actually kind of get at some of that angst. Like if you are worried or not if you are, because you are worried about climate change and your kids are also worried about climate change. Um, there are ways that you can talk about it just in an overall perspective, just to get them to think about it and to ask questions. And then there's a, it's a good way to have a, you can say that we're working on it, right? We, we know what the problem is. We have solutions in a way. We just need to make sure that these solutions are enacted, right? And so giving our students, or giving our students, giving our kids um, the notion to know that we can do something about it, I think is something that's really, is, is really important. <laughs> so I'll pass it to someone else. Thank you, Melissa. And your little one's already having these conversations as you're having the conversation with us. So yeah, Emily. Um, yeah, I can, I can speak to this a little bit. So, um, you know, my older daughter, right, when she, she was, and it was probably a year and a half ago, you know, she learned about climate change in school. And she came home and she said, is this real? And I was like, Mm -hmm. This is real. And, and she started crying. Right. And, and that's the right reaction. That is the right reaction to what's happening. Right. And, and not to sort of, sort of wallow in sadness, right. Because it's not exactly my personality, but, but um, it's real. Right. And, and like every other important thing that's real death, puberty, like, you have to talk to your kids about them, right? And, and so whether that's hard and you might mess it up the first time, you still have to talk to them about it. So, um, so my daughters, I explain climate change to them and I explain the cause, right? So I say, we burn fossil fuels when we do that, we emit gases, they stay in the atmosphere for a long time, they build up like a blanket, now we're sweating, ice caps are melting, sea levels rising, and there's more likely to be fires, right? But I, but I, so I explained the, the where, where the problem comes from, right? And then that we, because we understand the problem and we cause the problem, we can solve the problem, just like other problems in our household. If you cause it and you understand it, like you've broken something, often you can fix it, right? Especially with the parent's help. And so the, how I reassure my kids is to tell them that I'm working on it. I'm doing everything I possibly can. Um, to get society to pay attention to this, this issue. Um, the other thing that I talk with my kids about is that, um, that we can't solve it ourselves. This is a society problem. This is a community level problem. This is something that we'll have to come together to solve, but that people do hard things and this will be one of the hard things that we'll have to do soon. Um, and the other thing I do is I just remind them of it all the time. I'm like, shut the lights off for climate change. Do you care about climate change? Shut the lights off, right? I, I remind them, I remind them in a mom way, uh, sort of daily. Thank you. And Rosimar, you have a little, little one. I know you mentioned kind of, he loves to be outside and that conversation, you know, will happen, but do you still talk a little bit? Like, how do you, how do you approach that? So yeah, my my baby, I still call him my baby, even though he's into toddlerhood. <laughs> He's barely learning to talk now, but you know, the, the thing with children is that they understand way more than we think. And that's why we need to have these conversations. And so, yes, I'm learning as I go, but like, just like Emily said, let's turn off the lights for climate change. We also do things like, let's go for a walk instead of like playing with electronics and, Let's um, play outside. Let's enjoy the sunny day, right? And those are individual actions that I'm starting to take with hopes that they will like inform him. But something that is very important too is that we listen to our children, right? Mine is barely talking. <laughs> so not much to listen there in terms of how they feel about climate change. But for those older ones, we need to listen to them because we may think that they're feeling 
scared and that may be very true. I mean, we saw it in the cloud, but in the work cloud, we also saw things like we need to take action, we need to do something. And maybe that's how they feel too. Maybe they will ask us, well, like I'm scared, but I'm wondering if we know that this is a problem, why aren't we doing something about it, right? Um, you would be surprised by how much wisdom there is in our little ones' thoughts. And so I would say that while we may be like afraid of scaring them when we talk about climate change, we also need to listen to them and ask them how they feel about it. Thank you. And we do have a poll that people are responding to. Um, Paul or Dan, if you can put up the poll question that says, what percentage of people in the US talk about climate change? at least occasionally. So we have 35% as the one that most people have selected, 10%, 50%, and 75%. And I think um, the, the assessment that has been done says that it, has, that it is at 35% that people will talk occasionally at least about it. And then can we see the other poll that asks how many people in the US are concerned about climate change? And I know that people here have been saying that they've been concerned as well, um, as we've seen with the word cloud. And 63% is the majority of people who have voted 42%, 27% and 71%. And indeed it is, um, according to the assessment that's been made, it's 63% are concerned about the changing climate, which is, it's important because we have it as a way to be able to communicate. If people are, are aware of it, then we can feel reassured that hopefully we can all as a society be working towards making these changes. Um, thank you. Rana, can I add? Um, yeah. one, of the, one of the reasons that, you know, the three of us are here and, and we've kind of co-founded this new initiative called Science Moms is that, yes, we know that, you know, 63% of people in the United States are concerned about climate change. But when you specifically ask moms about it, it's 80% of moms are very concerned about climate change. And so we know that this is a group that really would take act, that would take action if they feel as though they have the resources to do something about it, right? They don't have to understand everything about climate change, like the nitty gritty details, but even just that simple um, example that Emily uses to talk with her kids about climate change is enough information to get people to wanna do something about it. And so we've really kind of wanted to provide moms and parents or whoever is listening with those tools that they need to be able to have a conversation because using our voice is just so important um, in, in, this, in, in this way to really think about this issue. Yeah, and thank you for bringing that up. So one of the other things, you know, Mother's Day is coming and we kind of were strategic about um, working with you all since we work with you as with NCAR works with CSU, NCAR works with scientists, scientists are at NCAR. And we've had some of you in our panels in the past um, but we haven't actually touched upon the personal side of the science that you do. So I, I'm, I appreciate that you bring up Science Moms because it is a campaign that's starting. Josimar, you are one of the newer people that are there, also Latinx, Hispanic. So you have that connection with another community, like I'm Latina. So it's a community that we don't really talk about things. So it's like, how do we bring this conversation up? And we have a video, if we can play it in a bit. Um, and because Emily, you kind of talked about, you know, while you're all raising your kids, this is the prime time. And by the time they're older, you know, this is the biggest impact that, that they're gonna face is the changing climate and the environment that they live in. Um, so I'm gonna have my tissue ready because I've watched this multiple times and it still gets to me because now I'm expecting to be a mom in midsummer. Um, so it's, it's, it's touching me definitely a lot more than it would, I think, um, otherwise, even though I do have nieces and nephews and cousins and everything, it's just, it, it's more impactful as it's happening now. Now I have, I have to like watch out for somebody else. Um, but Paul or Dan, can you please share the video by the time? As a scientist, I know by the time she takes her first breath, nine billion more tons of carbon pollution will be in the air. When she takes her first steps, wildfires will have burned millions more acres she could have explored. The day she gets her first pet, 
there are thousands of newly extinct species she'll never meet. The night she forgets to call, the night of her first heartbreak, her future home floods for the first of many times. By the time a child born today goes to college, it may be too late to leave them the world we promised. Our window to act on climate change is like watching them grow up. We blink and we miss it. It gives you something to think about in terms of the images that you might have of your own family or if you have kids or your neighbor's kids, like what it is like to, to have these big things happen in life and they're correlated with the changing environment. Yeah. Lorena, when I, even just hearing the words, you know, if those of you in the audience were able just to hear those words and just imagine, you know, the first time I watched that video, um, Mia was sitting in my lap and I literally just started crying, right? It's that moment where it says in a blink of an eye. And I think about these first five years have been literally a blink of the eye. And so to think that from, you know, the time that she's born or Lorena, you know, you're expecting in, you know, the time your baby is born to the time that they reach adulthood, like this is the time that we have in order to truly take action on climate change. That's not that, that's not that much time, right? And we probably should have been doing this yesterday, right? And so, you know, we really talk about this is that later is too late. Like this is the moment that we have to act right now. And if we can all collectively come together to, to use our voice and, and to, you know, interrogate at the local, the state, the national levels to ask, not even just ask, to really demand for action on climate change. Like this is what we have to do. And, and to really just, you know, have those conversations with our friends, our family members, at our children's schools, um, at our, you know, our government, our, with our governor, with our, with our mayor of our town that we may be in or whatever. Um, I think it's just really important to have those conversations. And that can be really intimidating to reach some of those levels. But I think the more and more people that we can have this conversation with and, and just thankful for all of you who are here today, um, that's really just the start of, of how we can really work towards action and to get rid of the gridlock that we've been facing and that we've been feeling um, as it relates to climate change. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. So, you know, when I think of uh, motherhood, right, the, the days are long, but the years are short, right? And so it's, it's, you know, you think about it the same as our, as our timeline for action here. And I think this is what, um, you know, putting it in this, this framing, right, is important for us to communicate. Um, by, you know, starting the Science Moms Initiative, I think one thing I've learned is, you know, new ways to communicate um, accurately so that people understand the timelines that we're talking about here with respect to, um, you know, changing our energy use um, and slowing down climate change. Thanks, Emily and Melissa. And Melissa touched upon, like, the collective action that we need to take. And I wanna emphasize that a lot of us have mentioned small actions that we take at home, right? Like telling our kids, let's shut up the lights for climate change. But in reality, climate change, it's not a me problem, it's an us problem. And we really have to come together to demand action, to demand a transition to more clean energy. And that's one of the things that we're trying to convey with Science Moms is that we really need to all come together. We're, we're targeting moms, right? Because moms are especially concerned and because just moms have this special ability of getting things done. But this is something that really, really, really affects us all. Moms, dads, parents, non-parents, everyone. And we have another video and um... Hopefully the, the video will work well for everybody. And if not, this will be available on the Science Moms website and you can check out more, more videos and um, also links on our Explorer series website. But I'll hand it over to Melissa if you could play that one real quick. Humans have been on earth for about 300,000 years, but we've only started polluting like this in the last 60. 
Our pollution stays in the air for thousands of years, creating a thickening blanket that traps heat in the atmosphere. That heat causes stronger hurricanes, bigger fires, more frequent floods, and the extinction of thousands of species. But there's good news. To stop the pollution blanket, we just have to stop polluting. Go to sciencemoms.com to learn how. Awesome. And there's a lot of resources on the web, web page. And I'll just read out loud one of the, the comments and questions, you know, that we got one from Kevon. It's very difficult for Thai parents to talk to their children as they're not informed. So how do we change that culture here? And I think for me, that's, that's also a thing. It's like, we just don't talk about anything. We don't talk about death in my family much. We don't talk about puberty. You just kind of, it kind of just happens um, and you have to figure it out. But climate change is something that's, you know, it's, it's out there. It's, it's, it's an everybody problem. But um, do you guys have any ideas or thoughts on how to talk um, to change the culture? Well, so that is one of the goals of Science Moms, right, is for, for us to work with professional communicators to craft information that's accurate, right, like the video you just saw, 30 seconds, that's the story, right, that it's, it's short, it's accurate, it um, is digestible we have we have a num we have some of those videos that are funny right and so that's one of our goals is to help that gap because it is very hard i think you know um not just you know throw shade on 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 people in my community but we've done a bad job as scientists communicating right and we're not really good at that you know <laughs> historically and we you know but we need to get better and we need to get better very, very fast, right? So that is the goal of Science Moms is to make this information on this issue as clear as possible. The essentials are there. You don't have to understand every nuanced bit of climate science. If you do, wonderful, come join me and do a PhD in our department. I would love to have you. But, but if you don't have that kind of time and you need to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and you still need to talk to your kids, like we have some nuggets here. We have myths and facts. We have videos, we have interviews, we have um, selected sets of books, right? Things that we feel as scientists are um, education tools we feel comfortable using. Um, and so that's one of our goals is to help bridge that because I, I agree that it's hard. Right, I have a hard time with my own kids, but but that's our goal. That's all I would say is that we have put together a lot of things with that in mind. And I think we also, you know, as moms and even as parents, you know, we ask other parents for advice on so many things. Right? Uh, this should be one of those questions. These this should be one of those areas that we should be asking questions to. So we we like to think um, we like you know moms trust moms for for advice on like the best stroller, you know, where to take my kid for this, you know, what's the best school for that or, you know, whatever it may be. And so like, just the only way that you can change the culture is to really start having a conversation, right? And our language and our experience and our communication improves with that practice. And so, you know, I think our, our videos are also really relatable right? It's relatable to the things that we do um, as just people and parents. And also with, with our work, it's like, it humanizes us as scientists, right? You know, I had a conversation the other day and someone was like, wow, you're so cool. You're just like us. And I was like, well, what were you expecting me to be like, <laughs> you know? And so just saying, you know, we're ordinary people who happen to be scientists as our profession. We're moms just like any other moms or parents just like any other parents. And so if we can come together on that shared value that we have, which is our kids or our future kids or whatever it may be, like people are, are so happy to talk about their children, right? It's the first thing you do is show pictures of your kids, right? Um, and so like, if we can think about the future of our kids, we want our kids to have a better life and here are the steps that we're gonna take. And we need all of you as, people, parents, whatever it may be, to want to be a part of that change. And it's not too difficult to ask people or to, to really ask our elected officials to do something about it. That's their job, right? You know, we're not politicians, so we're not making politics, we're not doing anything like this, right? But we can get people to use their voice to ask for that. We're asking them to do their job. We have the solutions. We want 
we need a, a more clean energy, you know, space for all of us. Yeah, and going back to the question, we wish we could have the, the content in all of the languages so that, for example, Thai parents could like be informed that's about this. Right now, our, all of our content is in English and Spanish. So we're hoping that we're bringing this educational message and this powerful message uh, across audiences, not just English speaking, but Spanish speaking for now as well. And we hope that this can help multiple communities and diverse communities in our country, especially those that are being affected um, the hardest to comprehend this information and you know, in simple digestible ways and also to inspire action. Yeah, there's a lot of resources out there. It's just a matter of like finding some that, that work for you and work for your families and friends. I know we have the UCAR um, site, the UCP site of, of NCAR has the GLOBE program, which is NASA funded program. And they have, um, they have books, it's called Elementary GLOBE books. And they're in multiple languages, not just English and Spanish. And they talk about different like air quality and climate clouds, soils, water, and they have activities that, you know, you can do with your kids too. Um, and then we had a comment in the ideas part of the slide, I was saying, you know, Denver meteorologist, you might know him, like, you might be aware, Mike Nelson, he's a co-author of a new short book titled The World's Littlest Book on Climate. Um, so there's a lot of people that are scientists who are publishing, they're using their voice to, to get like the story aspect. So I myself am a scientist, geophysics, so I studied earthquakes, but now I do science communication. And I think one of the things is how do we tell a story to engage with communities, to, to make it personal, to make it feel like I can connect with what they are saying. And that's part of what we do with Explore Series is try to work with scientists to talk with the general public and to have general public and everybody to be able to, to have this engagement. In a virtual world, it's been through the Slido platform. So I appreciate everybody logging on and asking your questions and comments. Um, you know, and we'll be back in person, hopefully by the by the new year. Um, but I think that's that's the importance is how do we make these connections, build stories, and share our personal like things that we do as scientists and how it impacts the societies that we live in and the communities that are most impacted, like you were saying, Josimar. Um. And I think, you know, one other thing that I want to say is that it's important and, you know, as science, science moms, we are a diverse group of moms because sometimes it's really important. We don't have to know the individuals, but if they see someone who looks like us, who's providing that information that makes sense to them. I think that's one of the most valuable things that can come out of this because you see that this, the issue of climate change is something that should matter to you, right? And so if you see someone who's credible or, or who you know has similar experiences to you, really being able to kind of communicate this message to you, that's one of the most important things that I, for me, that I see as part of this activity is just, um, it's just getting my voice to to other to other women to other black women who are out there so that they know that climate change is something that does impact their specific community or our specific community yeah and same for me with the hispanic and the spanish speaking communities as well um we we as any other people like have so much information out there and it's just very difficult to discern like what's true, what's not. And sometimes it's not relatable to us or it's sometimes, you know, we don't understand it. Like my parents, I, they don't speak English, right? So if I were to show them the videos, maybe they would not understand all the audio, but if um, the content is in Spanish, then it's accessible to them. And for me, that, that part, is very important as well. And I've already received comments like, oh, it's, it's so nice to see a familiar face, even though they don't know me. <laughs> but the fact that I look like them, that I speak like them, <laughs> that I speak in the language that they speak, then they, they call me a familiar face and 
at least some of the feedback I've gotten is that then the message like speaks to them and they can feel more connected and more informed and more empowered to take action. Yeah, thank you so much. And, you know, we had another comment from the ideas on Slido and it said, you know, many projections on climate change, I look forward, look forward until the year 2100 and look far away. But when starting my courses, I often ask my students whether they might have children in the future. And most of these children will still be alive in 2100. So thinking about, you know, you all are scientists right now and whatever our kids decide to do in the future, you know, I wonder if you have some advice for people who are interested in pursuing careers in atmospheric or related sciences um, that you can give us since we're kind of coming up to the top of the hour. Go ahead, Emily. You want me to jump in? <laughs> so um, let's think about it. Depends on your stage. Don't shy away from your math and physics and chemistry. That's the first one. But you also need to be able to write and you need to be able to um, see the big picture. So yeah. So you, if, if, that's, if you're interested in pursuing a career in one of these fields, you should do it. These uh, earth sciences are incredibly relevant to society. Um, I can't think of a, I can't think of a, an earth science field that, that doesn't matter very, very deeply for society. Um, and so we also need all kinds of brains, right? All kinds of brains. Um, so because these problems are hard and they'll really only be solved by a diversity of perspectives. So I'll stop there, but um, yeah, be a scientist. It's fun. It's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. And as I say by nature, you know, we we're all scientists, right? Especially when you think about us as kids, right? We're so curious about what's happening in the world around us, but then sometimes that just gets shut down or shut out for some reason. And I would say, you know, try out things that even just seem this much interesting to you, right? Like don't close doors in a way because you don't know what may come out of that. I'll say, you know, seek out internships, right? NCAR has a number of internships that, that are pretty awesome and I know changed my life um, in, in an amazing way. And I'll specifically shout out the SOURCE program for that. Um, but I'll say, you know, they can be life-changing experiences and really opens your eyes up more um, broader than anything that you would ever experience typically in school. So I think just be open to opportunities um, that are out there and, and have conversations with people. Like I get emails all the time that says, I just would love to learn more about what you do and how you got here, but also understanding that there are many different pathways to get into our field as well. So there isn't one right way um, to be able to go at it. So, so to be curious, um, to be open and to be willing, have willingness to actually learn. And something I'd like to add is that our field intersects with so many other fields, right? We heard Emily earlier speak about working with epidema, epi oh, so sorry, <laughs> epidemiologists and economists. Um, there is uh, so many people in private industry, in Wall Street, in the um, shipping companies, in, in so many fields that they come to earth scientists for uh, collaborations, for um, work on like, or advice on uh, topics that matter to them. Like if there is a truck traveling across the United States transporting your mayonnaise, they need to know about the weather, right? And they need to know about the weather conditions. And, and so uh, our field uh, intersects with so many other fields and that, is something that, in my opinion, makes it so beautiful because it can appeal to so many of your other interests that you may have, right? You may like um, transportation, banking, um, news, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. It more than likely intersects with earth sciences, earth sciences and you can make a very unique career path with those intersections of different interests. Yeah, and- Don't get bored. <laughs> you won't get bored yeah and you know I do the science communication aspect of it but there's people that do journalism and they go into news reporting um there's artists who will draw like 
comic books about science. You know, there's a lot of different mediums to be able to connect with people in different ways. Um, so keep reaching for the stars and, you know, everybody can have a voice. Everybody has a voice to be able to share what it is that they need from, from their communities and people who, who, who um, represent us. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists and thank you to everybody who participated. Um, we had a lot of comments um, as we were going through the conversation and I will be sharing all of these with our panelists. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Dan and Paul for supporting this event. Um, so thank you, Melissa, Rosimar and Emily for joining us today. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Thanks for having us and happy Mother's Day. Yes. Happy Mother's Day. We'll see you all for the next Explorer Series event, and we'll talk to you all soon. See ya.